Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith along with Akiko Fujita. Let's get you up to speed on the market action as investors await the high stakes debt ceiling meeting at the White House. That's set to kick off in just about an hour. You're looking at losses across the board, although we aren't trading too far to the downside. The Nasdaq, the underperformer here as we Under the final hour of trading, Nasdaq off just about a half of a percent, S&P off about a third of a percent here. In terms of what is underperforming materials, the worst performing sector as well as technology, followed by healthcare energy actually bucking that downward trend. President Biden meeting with top congressional leaders in about an hour to go over the debt ceiling, trying to reach some sort of agreement. President Biden will have to convince Republican leaders Kevin McCarthy, also Senator Mitch McConnell, to raise the debt ceiling or risk defaulting. The Treasury Department has warned that the U.S. could run out of money to pay its bills as soon as June 1st if action is not taken. We have Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman and Josh Schaefer here to break it all down, talking about exactly what's going on in D.C., how that could potentially play into the markets here. But Rick, let's start with you just in terms of should we be optimistic that anything's going to come out of this meeting later on this afternoon? I'm not. Uh, and I don't think it's I don't think this is going to be a market moving meeting, if you will. Um, this is the beginning of the conversation between President Biden and uh, the Democrats and uh, the Republicans in Congress. Just to remind everybody where we're at on this, uh, the Republicans who control the House, they have passed a bill that would um, raise the borrowing limit, but what, it would also cut spending by something like four and a half trillion dollars over a decade. And the Democrats who control the House have said that's way too much. And I've, there's now been some economic analysis that says um, if we were to get that amount of spending cuts, it would actually um, contribute to an economic downturn or make a recession worse if we are uh, going to have a recession later this year, early next year. I mean, that's money that's based spending that's basically would come out of the economy and it would be a lot of spending that comes out. So um, what kind of, how do they make a deal to get this done? So the, Repu- the Republicans are gonna say, we have to have some spending cuts. Could it be half of what the Republicans are asking for? Would Biden agree with that? Um, there are some other things in place. So there is a pathway to a deal here. It just depends how hard how hard-headed and stubborn uh, the politicians want to be. Yeah, Rick, it feels like we've been here before, and increasingly the expectation, it appears, is that there's just going to kick the can down the road. I mean, what a, happens that, that's, if that's the case? So that's another outcome is uh, that, uh, I mean, any way you break this up, it is kicking the can down the road. So, but, you, but how far down the road are you going to kick the proverbial can is a question. So if they can't reach a deal um, to raise the borrowing limit in, in the immediate term, one thing they can do is say, let's put this off for three months uh, because at the end of September, uh, that's when we need to get a new budget or a set of budgets for the next fiscal year. And we could ball all of this up together and deal with funding for the government for the next fiscal year and the borrowing limit at the same time. That doesn't mean the borrowing limit would magically be easier to solve if, if we uh, delay it for a couple of months or a few months into the fall. It just means we'd have the whole thing coming together at once. And then here's a treat. We might be able to have a debt ceiling shutdown and a government shutdown at the same time. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> Why not put it all together? But I mean, even if they do raise the borrowing limit, the way this always works is they set a new seal. They, w- they will never say it's an unlimited borrowing limit. They could, by the way, they could say it's unlimited. We're not going to go through this anymore. But by definition, they're just going to set another ceiling and we're going to get to it again, whether it's next year or the year after that. And Josh, do you think that's why markets are simply shrugging it off, at least until this yeah. point? Because when you take into all the warnings, the dire warnings have been out from top economists, from those even inside the White House, investors up until this point don't really seem to care. Yeah, and that's sort of historically how it's worked out too, which I found interesting. Bank of America was pointing out in a note recently that you don't normally see the market volatility until about two weeks prior to the X date. The X date right now is that June 1 date that Janet Yellen had highlighted. That's what people are sort of watching as a potential X date. So that would actually be next week that you'd probably start to see more volatility. I do think it's probably why markets are relatively flat and there's not a lot of action today because people are sort of waiting to see what does come from this meeting if anything. And also, of course, you have the inflation report tomorrow and plenty of other things to watch. There's plenty of other things going on other than the debt ceiling. I think that's what markets are also saying right now, too. We have a banking crisis going on. We have plenty of things going on where people are already concerned about that. So to add this on top of it is certainly adding a hint of volatility. And then we've seen in the past, if this were to keep carrying out, as Rick was mentioning, it has weighed on the S&P 500 before. Think about 2011 when the stocks took a very, very big decline that year as the debt ceiling crisis continued. Yeah, Josh, you just mentioned a number of factors. We haven't even talked about earnings. We're right in the middle right. of earnings season. <laughs> right. There's so many different market movers here. So when you 
when you talk to Wall Street analysts, I mean, how significant a risk is this really from a market perspective? Because we have been here before. Right. Akiko, I don't think it's a risk. It, it doesn't seem like analysts think it's a risk until we get closer. We're still technically at least three weeks out from this happening. And that's if it were to happen right on June 1st, we should note that that's not necessarily a hard and fast date, June 1st. That's when it could happen. It could happen later. Um, but I think when you take a further look, it's essentially we need to get closer to that date and we need to see how far away the two sides are. But as I mentioned before, what Analysts are comparing this to is 2011, where you saw a big run up in the S&P 500 for the first five or so months of the year. Then the debt ceiling debate really started in May and the S&P 500 took a big dive down that year, was positive up over about 6% and dove down about 10% over the summer. So that's what people are worried about. There's one call out there, Evercore ISI, saying that they think markets need to drop for something to actually happen with the debt ceiling, which is interesting. They're calling for the S&P 500 to hit 3,800 before something happens. So essentially saying politicians might wait until there's more concern from the general public about this, which is always interesting. I think investors also consider this a binary risk. Either we have a default scenario or we don't. And you can probably put the odds of a default scenario at um, 5%. But I'd say between five and 10%. Not likely to happen, but not impossible that it could happen either. So th there's a, th the, the overwhelming likelihood is we're gonna at some point get to the other side of this and just sort of go back to the way it was before we had to deal with the debt ceiling showdown. Um, but then you have to try to plan for what if the worst thing happens. So it's just a weird, you know, markets have a hard time hedging for man-made, person-made, if you will, uh, political um, problems. Yeah. Uh, Rick, I mean, we're talking about this in, in the context of the markets, obviously, we're Yahoo Finance, but I want to ask you about the political calculation of this, because uh, there's no question both parties are looking at 2024. Nobody wants a default on their watch. What's the calculation here on the Republican side, particularly Kevin McCarthy, and then President Biden? I, I scratch my head on this one, Akiko, so I, I know what the political calculation is. Uh, McCarthy and the Republicans think there are political points for them to earn by showing that they are uh, that they care a lot about the budget deficit and about this gigantic $31 trillion debt and that they will appeal to people who think spending is out of control. And that does have some rhetorical appeal, but the things that they are talking about cutting are programs that people actually like. And guess what? These are actually programs that are very important in red states. Um, so if the Republicans, like the worst thing that could happen for Republicans is they would get their way and this, all this, these spending cuts would go into effect, then Biden would be able to blame whatever economic downturn comes, he'd blame it on the Republicans, and he would also be able to point to voters in Republican states suffering because um, education programs got cut, healthcare programs got cut, um, other types of aid, um, food aid uh, in rural areas got cut, rural hospitals um, running out of, I mean, the, it's, it's a, the list of things that would get cut is a mile long, um, but Republicans think that there are some voters out there, I guess they can win over by saying we have to cut government spending. Biden, for his part, just says, I'm, we're holding a line in the sand. These are, these are programs that people care about. I'm not sure that's a winning uh, line either because Biden's approval is also declining. <laughs> so I, as we've seen before, there are no winners here. Certainly doesn't sound like there will be any winners if, in fact, this uh, negotiation uh, continues on for quite some time as we get closer to that June 1st. But Josh, when we come to some investment opportunities, Bill Gross was out, talk, going back to what Rick was saying, only, what, 5 to 10 percent, 5 percent uh, chance that we would actually default. He's seeing some opportunity in treasuries. Right, because, I mean, there is, as Rick was saying, you're talking about a 5 percent chance of this actually happening, the U.S. actually defaulting on that debt. So people see opportunities in treasury yields. Treasury yield prices have spiked with this uncertainty. And so Bill Gross essentially saying he's looking at the short term treasury market right now as an opportunity because this spikes every time. And then, as he said, quote, it's ridiculous. He told Bloomberg it is always resolved. And that is not a hundred hundred percent chance, but it does almost always get resolved. So he's basically saying he's counting on history here and he's trading off that. And I'm sure some people will probably be following right. Congress is creating an arbitrage opportunity <laughs> right. for the smartest investors in the world. Way to go, Congress. Exactly <laughs> what people want to hear. <laughs> uh, Rick, I want to talk about the backdrop to all of this, because there's a new poll out from Gallup showing Americans have very little confidence in major economic leaders. Now, I want to point to some highlights. 35 percent of Americans say they have a fair or great deal of confidence that Joe Biden will recommend the right thing for the economy. 
36% say they have confidence in Jay Powell versus 54% say they have almost no confidence in the Fed chair. And then you've got 37% say they have confidence in Treasury, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. In Congress, the numbers are very similar. Um, I'm not sure this is entirely a surprise, but uh, I mean, where does that leave us? Because we're talking <laughs> about the impact to the markets, the politics, yeah. but at the end of the day, it is what's the impact to average Americans if we do come down to that X day? I think Bodie McBoatface has better ratings on the economy than any of the actual <laughs> leaders uh, we've got here. This is a bit of a puzzle because uh, we have super low unemployment. I mean, unemployment is still the lowest since 1969. That's obviously great for workers. We've seen wages rising. That's great for workers. Um, I think this tells us a couple of things. Number one, uh, inflation really is pernicious. Uh, I think we forgot about how nasty inflation is and how it really wrecks confidence. And I think that's part of it. I also, th also think President Biden has just not done a great job uh, convincing people that the uh, about you know th the things that are actually good in the economy, um, he you know he doesn't do press conferences. His his stumbles tend to get more attention than uh, most other things, and I, I don't feel like he has a really strong messaging program either. So I think that's part of it. Look, Biden won the election in 2020. Uh, something worked with voters, and um, maybe they'll rally around him a little bit more as we get closer to 2024. Okay, and a reminder, of course, that meeting at the White House happening at 4 o'clock Eastern. We'll all be watching. Josh and Rick, thanks so much for that. Bye, guys. Well, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, CPI data set to drop tomorrow. We're going to preview what to expect as the battle against inflation carries on. Plus, Nikola Motors shares sinking on earnings as it tries to navigate a turnaround. The company's CEO is going to be joining us later this hour. And we've got more earnings set to come after the bell. We'll break down the numbers from Airbnb, Rivian, and Occidental Petroleum once they report. Stick around.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Let's take a quick look at the major indices. We've got less than an hour to go before the closing bell. We are seeing right across the board, pretty flat, at least if you look at the Dow right now, down about nine points, the S&P 500 down 12 and the Nasdaq down 70. Investors bracing for tomorrow's CPI report and President Biden's debt ceiling meeting with top lawmakers. That's coming up uh, in about 45 minutes or so. Joining us now is Ross Mayfield, Baird Investment Strategy Analyst. Ross, I want to pick up on the conversation we had before the break. Uh, we were talking about the impact, the debt ceiling discussions, especially if we go past that X date, what that's likely to mean for the markets. It feels like the markets are kind of taking that in stride right now. It does. We're trading at the top end of a range that we've been stuck in for a while, but on better than expected earnings, um, the market ha has been buoyant and it hasn't really been reflecting uh, those debt ceiling concerns or really even much of the concerns about the banking crisis yet. You know, we kind of stand in the in the arena where we think something gets done, but uh, like the, the Evercore analysis mentioned earlier, you know, oftentimes it's market volatility that draws policymakers to the table. I don't know if it's that they need to feel it a little more viscerally um, to kind of reinforce what would happen if something like this were to come to pass. Um, but I do think like 2011, that that volatility in the market will be the catalyst. Um, but it might take until kind of the, the final deadline to get that done. So I think over the coming weeks, you know, you mentioned uh, short term treasury yield spiking. Those might continue to rise. But I think especially in the equity market, some some heightened volatility and, and downside skew is likely. So, Ross, you mentioned that volatility in the market might be the catalyst here in order to get um, congressional leaders to reach an agreement. What's going to be the catalyst, though, for the market to get it out of that thirty eight hundred to forty two hundred range? Is it a debt ceiling deal or does it need to be something else? I'm not sure that it's the debt ceiling that's holding the market uh, either up or back. I mean, obviously, if you break through the debt ceiling and default on the debt, that might be the catalyst to the downside. We don't think that's very likely. You know, I think the one thing to remember is that markets can trade in these ranges and can trade kind of flat to sideways with some chop for really long extended periods of time. Um, we're not always in an ascendant bull market and we're not always in these terrible bear markets like 2022. So I think that in the in this kind of interim period where rates are a little sticky, inflation is a little sticky, but earnings are hanging in there, the consumer is proving resilient. I wouldn't be surprised to see us trade in this range or kind of bouncing around in this area for, for maybe long longer than would be comfortable for most investors. Um, I think to break out to the upside, you need the Fed to be done, you need inflation to be back below 3%, and you need to show that there wasn't widespread economic damage you know, outside of what might, what might already be expected uh, from the market. So that'll take time to for the market to get that data and feel comfortable with that outlook. So again, we could be here for a while. Uh, Ross, we've got about 85% of the S&P 500 companies already reporting. I mean, it was sort of negative going into the earnings season, but things have kind of improved. I mean, you could argue that expectations were so low given the macro environment, but I wonder what stood out to you so far in terms of what we've heard from the companies and what that tells you about where we're headed. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, earnings had certainly been de-risked by how negative things had gotten. But I do think that the number one thing you're seeing is that companies and, and corporate operators are finally starting to get a really good handle on how to operate in this macro environment. You saw that uh, with all the upside surprises and all the beats, you know, above the one and five year averages, which is really, you know, impressive considering what we were looking at a couple of years ago. Um, so, and, and then even on the guidance side, things haven't been super rosy, but they're not as dour as you might expect given higher interest rates, Fed hiking, debt ceiling looming, banking crisis, you know, unfolding. Um, you know, guidance was, was, as far as negative guidance was actually better than long-term averages. So I think it's just a case of corporate operators finally getting a better handle on things. I think inflation has improved really dramatically, especially on the raw material side of things. And I think labor shortages and labor problems are, are kind of falling by the wayside as the labor market softens as well. So not quite as negative. And yeah, uh, you, you really like to see the upside surprise here to start the year out right. Ross, what, is, what does all this mean for Fed policy? Because if you take a look at the swaps, they're still suggesting that we could at least see a half a point cut before the end of the year. Yet you had the teams at Goldman and at Barclays coming out betting against rate cuts before the end of the year. What do you think is likely on the table? I think the Fed does not want to cut. They've, they've come out at basically every opportunity and said, we're not going to cut. We want to hold higher for longer. We might not even be done hiking. 
I think they should be done hiking. I, I'm not sure they should have hiked last meeting, but irregardless, they want to be higher for longer until inflation is back towards that 2% target. Um, the, 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 what the market is anticipating, in my assumption, is that inflation will come down faster than expected, but more likely than not, that something like this banking crisis will lead to a harder landing than the Fed anticipates. You know, They don't think there will be no economic pain, but they're certainly still uh, preaching the soft landing scenario. Um, we think that's possible. You know, the consumer has been really resilient, uh, but the market, I think, pricing and rate cuts in the back half of the year is seeing something a little gnarlier and something that the Fed will have to deal with by cutting rates. So it's really up to, in my opinion, at this point for 2023, does the banking crisis lead to a dramatic slowdown in lending at small and mid-sized banks? And what does that do for employment at small and mid-sized uh, companies? Uh, we'll, we'll find out soon. I think some of the data that's coming in suggests we're, we're going to see a slowing there. And the Fed may have to cut. I think they'd be loath to, uh, but they might have to. All right, Ross Mayfield, always, get to, always great to get your perspective. Baird Investment Strategy Analyst. Well, coming up, regional banks are on the move again today. This time, at two, they were to the downside. Now they're pointing to the upside here with PacWest up just about 6%. We'll take a closer look at the health of the sector and also what we're seeing from the consumer on the other side of the break. Hard-hit regional banks are back in the green today, but it has certainly been a tough couple of trading weeks here for these names. PacWest, Western Alliance, among the worst performers over the past five trading days as investors still continue to worry about some of the stress that we have seen in this sector. The S&P regional banking ETF down nearly 12% in the past month. For more on this, we want to bring in Brendan Coughlin. He's a Citizens Financial Vice Chairman and Head of Consumer Banking. Brendan, it's great to see you here in studio again. So just give us a sense 
from what you're seeing and what you're seeing in terms of client behavior? Yeah, look, the, the market is uh, reacting very different than what we're seeing inside the bank. Um, you break up the world up into consumers, into wealth customers, and then corporates. And uh, citizen skews very heavily into the consumer uh, base. It's been extremely stable. In fact, um, through when SVB failed in early March through today, we've been generally flat in deposits. We've seen some outflows, but a lot of inflows too. Uh, uh, there's been a little bit more volatility in the wealth segment and commercial where they're kind of getting down to the FDIC cap. But banks, uh, there's a flight to safety going on now. And banks our size are seeing a lot of folks diversifying in as much as out. So um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of stability in the business. Yeah, what does that tell you about where the consumer is? I and mean, we talked a lot about where the savings rate is potentially sort of diminishing after so much had been saved up over the last several years. I mean, what are you seeing on that front? And what does that tell you about where the mindset is? Yeah, consumers are still very resilient and strong. And really what we're seeing right now is a normalization, which has been expected for quite some time. Uh, consumers you know, were about 40% high in deposits uh, from pre-COVID to the peak. Uh, that's been cut by about half, so you're starting to see a little bit of a diminishment in excess liquidity. But by and large, consumers are still very much more healthy right now than they were even pre-COVID. On the credit side, we're also seeing a, a very mild uptick in delinquencies. But that, I would just classify that as a normalization. It's still well below where it was pre-COVID. There's nothing I'm looking at right now that would suggest there's a lot of risk in the health of the consumer other than a normalization, which we all expected coming off the heels of COVID. And Britton, when we talk about the volatility that we've seen in regionals, of course, there's been brought to light, or I should say re-entered the discussion, some additional regulations and what exactly that could potentially do to a bank like yours. Give us a sense of why you think, I would guess, that it's probably not the best idea and what a landscape dominated by big banks, what that would mean for consumers. Well, we, we already are compliant with regulations that would be for the next tier up uh, versus uh, where we're at now as a category four bank. We're the um, one of the highest capitalized banks in our peer set. Uh, we've got plenty of excess liquidity. Our, our deposit base already skews heavy consumer. It's very stable. And so, uh, you know, all the regulation that's being discussed around uh, liquidity actions and tightenings, we, we feel good about it, that we're already uh, sort of compliant with all those uh, regulations. I, I don't know that it's necessary if you just act Academically looked at the health of the regional banking sector as a whole. Uh, there's a risk for overcorrection. The question is, uh, right now, what the market is really reacting to is fear more than facts. And so is there a need for some stability through regulation is, is really what I think the regulators are, are, are debating right now. Uh, but there's, there's nothing that we would see inside of the institution that would suggest there's a need for a lot more regulation uh, with the facts that we're looking at. Brennan, getting a little bit more about the consumer, you talked about the savings rate, what we're seeing in terms of delinquencies. What are you seeing in terms of spending patterns, what people are spending on and where? Yeah, spending is up um, substantially still from pre-COVID, uh, about 15%. Uh, it's been flat, though, the last couple of quarters. So you're also starting to see a normalization. About half of the excess spending from pre-COVID is actually real goods and services. People are buying more things. The other half is inflation-based. Uh, and you're seeing a normalization there, too. So travel's coming back. Gas is coming back. Restaurants are still... So you're hard-pressed to even find a reservation at restaurants these days. So, uh, you know, a lot like the consumer, when you look at the actual data, the economy still feels really strong. There's obviously storm cl clouds gathering on the horizon, but the behavior of the consumer hasn't followed suit the way you would normally expect. Does that surprise you, given the fact that there are so many things to be a bit worried about? And we haven't even talked about the debt ceiling yet. You know, we uh, went through an unprecedented time period in COVID, uh, and I think hindsight's 2020, but the overstimulation of the economy with um, lots of free money, whether it's in the form of not having to make loan payments or extra stimulus or fiscal policy, I think has created a bit of a vacuum here that we, uh, it's hard to actually predict and model. There's no comp, comp for this in the market. And so it, it's not all that surprising if you stare at consumers and they still have more money in their pocket, uh, generally speaking, than they did before COVID and uh, their debt loads are lower, that they're feeling confident enough to spend. I think it will take unemployment really picking up before this becomes a real moment for consumers and it really changes behavior. Um, and we'll see. We'll see how that, the next couple of quarters play out. Yeah, and up until now, the labor market has certainly been extremely resilient. Brendan, what do you make of the negotiations, the showdown of what's happening right now down in D.C. over the debt ceiling and how serious 
the potential fallout could potentially look for your sector? You know, we've been here um, every time, yeah. every, every year, every two years. And so, uh, you, uh, you know, I like to believe that it's just political jockeying and hopefully we'll get a, a last minute deal. I think that's what most people would believe will end up happening. Um, you know, normally that's the way you look at this is that it's, it's politics and you kind of control what you can control. With what's going on right now in the market on fear-based trading, uh, I think you just have to look at it and say, uh, make sure you're running a safe and sound institution. Make sure we're creating plenty of liquidity in case of the unknown, whether it's debt ceiling, whether it's another bank failure. You gotta be prepared for these things. And so we're taking a lot of actions to put our arms around our customers, make sure that uh, we're viewed as a safe destination uh, for deposits. Uh, we're lending out prudently to customers that we have relationships with. The bank is still wide open for business, but we're taking uh, precautionary measures. Right now it's about balancing defense and offense. We're also playing a lot of offense. We're growing in New York City. We're doing a bunch of things uh, to really uh, make sure, you know, when, when in markets of turmoil uh, in any industry, you get winners and losers and folks that come out of this cycle uh, in better positions end up winning in the long run. So we're really trying to balance that defensive and offensive mindset uh, to navigate uh, through the cycle. Are you optimistic we're going to be able to avoid a recession? Powell seemed a little bit more optimistic than he had been at the last meeting. I, I personally, I'm not an economist, mm -hmm. but uh, with everything that I see, it feels unavoidable to me that we're going to hit some level of a recession. The way I would call it would be a much more mild one. I think the strength of the consumer will buoy the economy uh, and protect against a deep and prolonged recession. I think we'll see uh, a run-of-the-mill recession. Now, for most of us, we haven't been through one of those in an awful long time. So what is a run-of-the-mill <laughs> recession? But I do think we'll ultimately have to have unemployment get up a little bit higher to stem inflation. And getting inflation back down under control will still be a top priority of the administration. And it feels, it feels very hard to believe that we can get that to happen with Without some level of recession to me. All right, Brendan Coughlin, always great to speak with you of Citizens Financial. Same Thanks here. So much Thanks for a lot for having us. me. All right, well, coming up next, three stocks to watch, including Boeing, the stock getting a bounce today after announcing a major order. We've got the details for you straight ahead.
people are actually going to need to figure out how to be good investors going forward, and we have not yet mentally adjusted. What happened over the last 10 years is abnormal. One of my main takeaways is that people look a little too happy for me here. I, we're a little bit more pessimistic about the global outlook, and I'm struck by the fact that I think sentiment's actually still relatively positive here. Our view remains that at the moment the markets are over-optimistic uh, around uh, where we're headed with both rates uh, and, and recession. And what I mean by that is that actually they're underestimating the strength of the American economy, which actually is in very good shape. The consumer is continuing to spend, you know, early days they spent money on goods, now they're spending money on services. But the economy is actually doing pretty well. That's the good news. The bad news is that means the Fed's going to have to do more to begin to slow aggregate demand. My main message to you would be that our outlook is more negative going forward than probably consensus and more people need to catch up with us, which means that we're probably going to have more volatility and more drawdowns ahead of us. Are you still seeing the appetite for ESG research, ESG knowledge, let's say three years into all this interest really exploding into the scene? I do, like it's, it's not going away. Like, you know, like most markets, right? People can get ahead of themselves and overpromise and underdeliver. I think ESG is true also. Like we're going to be, there's going to be a big global push to be carbon neutral by 2050. It's hard to argue that we're that the world isn't heading towards a more carbon neutral, um, you know, state of being, uh, and so we want to be at there at the forefront of that to help clients figure out what's real, what's not real, who's actually doing things versus who's just saying they're doing things. I think the traditional model that an investor built uh, is now going to be challenged a bit as you take as you leverage AI to be able to find sort of in unique insights. And so I think the asset managers that have the bigger and broader data set that they can apply AI to are going to have an advantage. The hustle and bustle of downtowns and city centers across the country are still not back to pre-pandemic levels, but the suburbs, they seem to be benefiting from that trend. Our Diane King-Hal joins us now with the latest on those details. Hey, Diane. Hey, Shauna. All right, so there's a newly released back-to-work barometer. It shows that office occupancy rates are still below 50%. It's according to this report out this week from Castle Systems. Now, Castle measures security swipes via fobs, badges. We all know those badges that we check in with its, and its app weekly to get its data. So that factor or that data is showing still below pre-pandemic levels. You're seeing it tick up a little bit compared to the week prior, but still below 50%. Another measure of the return to office shows that pedestrian foot traffic is still down, some 25% in April compared to the same time period in 2019. That's according to MRI Springboard. But that slow return to office is a boon for the burbs, suburbs, that is. Real estate firm CBRE says that in the second half of last year, the availability of urban retail space outpaced suburban retail availability for the first time in about 10 years. Uh, so that means there is more, more demand, rather, for the suburban space now. So, Diane, what does this mean going forward? The demand that we are seeing here, is that expected to continue, do you think? So, well, suburbia, def suburbia rather definitely has the upper hand in terms of pricing power when it comes to commercial real estate. Uh, I went to a commercial real estate conference recently, as you know, and there was nervousness in the air because of just the issues that are happening within the commercial real estate industry, particularly when you think of downtowns, city centers, et cetera. The power dynamic is still really a push-pull between employers and employees. Employers want employees to come back to the office, but they still don't have the same leverage that they had once upon a time. And plus, the fabric of the workforce and how people work has changed so they're still willing to employers still willing to accept uh you know uh, a hybrid workforce so again that gives the shift to suburban uh, uh, real estate um, power players. Uh, for instance, you have certain companies also pivoting to match where demand is now, such as Sweetgreen. They've increased their footprint in suburbia because 
They're going to go where the customers are. Yeah, they have to go where the customers are. And there was a new report out from Axios earlier this week saying that yep. in New York, office occupancy is still just 60% of what it was pre-pandemic. Yeah. yeah, so similar to the other metric that we yeah. just looked at. So, yeah, you know, it's within that 50 back to anytime 60% soon. Percent range. Yeah, stuck in that range. All right, Dan King Hall, thanks so much. You got it. I want to get to some breaking news. A jury has determined former President Donald Trump is liable for the sexual abuse of former magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll. Now, in a civil suit, Carroll accused the former president of raping her in a department store in the mid-1990s, then said that Trump defamed her when he denied the accusation. The jury also found Trump liable for defamation, determining that Trump should pay Carroll $5 million in damages. Trump has denied all wrongdoing. Coming up, tech layoffs are mounting. Find out the latest company to be affected next. LinkedIn becoming the latest tech giant to cut jobs. A social media platform that's owned by Microsoft is cutting more than 700 jobs around the world amid slower demand and changing customer behavior. It is also closing down its Chinese-focused jobs app called InCareer, which has struggled against local competition. Microsoft shares are trading today off just about seven-tenths of a percent. We are shifting gears to the world of, elect of electric vehicles. Shares of EV truck maker Nikola moving to the downside today with shares off just about 13% after the company missed on its most recent earnings results. Joining us now to break all that down and give us a look ahead for the future of Nikola vehicles, we want to bring in Michael Loeschler. He's the CEO of Nikola Corporation, also Pro Supermania and our autos reporter joining the conversation as well. Michael, it's good to see you here. So certainly judging by the reaction in shares today off just about 13%, the street was not satisfied with these results, turning low here after your revenue miss, also the production pause. What's your message following this quarter? The message from our side is we are very focused on North America and the fuel cell truck, and we also build up the hydrogen infrastructure at the same time. We have taken important decisions. We have actually sold our European business to Iveco because it's in very good hands there. 
And obviously, it's important that we stay focused going forward. In terms of the pause of the battery election truck is something which makes sense before we launch our fuel cell truck. And we are happy to take orders for the battery electric truck going forward because we have a flexible manufacturing line. So we are very focused, focusing on the key things for Nikola, and that is certainly North America, the fuel cell truck, and hydrogen infrastructure. Hey, Michael Pross here. So I guess uh, help us understand sort of the why the joint venture between you and IFCO, the big, large European truck maker, why did you guys decided to sell that business off to them? I know you want to focus on the North American market, um, but does that deal continue forward? Do you guys still want to uh, work with IFCO and use them as a, as a parts and chassis supplier? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a strong partnership and Iveco will stay a shareholder of Nikola and we will take their cabins and their e-axle so we have a long-term supply agreement. So it's a really good partnership. But the reason why it makes so much sense, I mean, it's better that Iveco in Europe focuses on the European execution of things. And we do the same here in North America. It's much easier to do this here. And we also need our engineering resources now to finalize our fuel cell truck. So I think this is really a win-win for both companies. So, Michael, here in the U.S., you are pausing production of that battery electric truck, like you said, at the Arizona plant as you work to modify that plant. What do your production targets look like for this year? And given the fact that we could see slowing growth in the second half of the year, how do you see that potentially affecting your business? So we are actually more optimistic for the second half of the year in particular because we will launch our fuel cell truck, which is a best in class truck with a range of up to 500 miles. And now we gave guidance this morning between 375 and 500 trucks for the total year. But we lean more towards the fuel cell truck because we get feedback from customers that they prefer the better range, the lower fuel time, and also the weight. So this is clearly going in the direction of the, the, the fuel cell truck, where also Nikola has a first mover advantage. There is nobody else out there. And at the same time, we put up the energy infrastructure. So we lean more towards the fuel cell truck here. So, but Michael, you don't see any signs of curbing demand or anything from some of your clients out there, potential clients, just in terms of the fact that we could, in fact, see a harsher slowdown than we had initially anticipated. Well, look, I mean, the, the um, zero emission mobility segment is still very, very small and is growing. And we see that customers are very interested in that. So we don't sense that we are impacted by the overall economy. It's more about like the ESG roadmap and that people really now want to go into trucks without emission. That is what is happening. Our biggest bottleneck is really setting up the infrastructure for the electric trucks. But we try to find solutions with customers and dealers to do this as quickly as possible. Hey, Michael, so I know those customers include companies like Walmart and also a, another private provider of, of service with the U.S. Postal Service. What are they telling you about that whole um, infrastructure build out? Because there aren't that many hydrogen uh, stations in the, in the U.S. that can actually re refuel these um, fuel cell trucks. Exactly right. And that's why unique, Nikola is uniquely positioned to set up really the hydrogen infrastructure and we will produce green hydrogen distribute it and then dispense it because you have to really offer both things. I think we have a world-class truck, but we also need to have the energy infrastructure. And we also offer very innovative things like a mobile fueler so that we can bring our mobile fueler to the customer and then the customer can fuel there. But it's very, very important. You need to have both. We always say you need to have the chicken and the egg. That is what customers are expecting. And I think Nikola is uniquely positioned to offer this. Michael, there's a big focus on your cash reserves, your cash burn that you just reported here in Q1. Some concerns just that you're going to have to need to raise more funds. Do you have another? Are you thinking about considering more stock sales? Sure. I mean, two things. First of all, cash burn will come down quite a bit because we have invested a lot in R&D and you see the results. I mean, we have fantastic products, but going forward, R&D will come down. And also cash burn then will go down. At the same time, yes, we will have to raise capital. We also ask stockholders for approval beginning of mm -hmm. June so that we have a foundation then to issue more shares and raise more capital going forward. Michael Loeschler, CEO of Nikola Motors, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. All right, coming up, we check in on a few trending tickers ahead of the closing bell. Stick around.
It's time for a triple play. Three stocks that we're watching in the final 10 minutes of trading. We've got Boeing, Under Armour, and Disney. Let's kick it off with Boeing, my pick today, the stock moving higher, up just about 2% in the final couple of minutes of trading. Boeing securing a huge order from Ryanair worth $40 billion. Now the budget carrier agreeing to buy up to 300 737 MAX jets. Deliveries are going to start in 2027 and they will replace many of Ryanair's older aircraft. Now in a statement, Ryanair Group CEO said that the new planes are going to offer 21% more seats while also burning 20% less fuel. And it wasn't all, though, good news for Boeing. We did see shares pull back from the highs of the session for just a bit after the company announced that its April deliveries fell by about half, comparing that to the March numbers that was due to a manufacturing defect. But, Ali, it looks like the streets really focus on that order from Ryanair and what that could mean for maybe other orders here going forward, given the recovery that we're starting to see in travel. Yeah, and I think it's across the board, right? We've heard positive news on the cruise uh, line side, obviously with flights and airlines. That's a big deal as well. You know, Ryanair, I went, I had a flight on Ryanair a few years ago. Was it a positive experience? It was not a positive experience. The plane landed on its side, and then we eventually leveled out, but we so all they, live to tell the story. So they need new planes. They need, they need new planes. 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 I think it's the 20% increase Increase for the amount of people that that'll be interesting. I hope that doesn't mean smaller seats yeah. because Ryanair is not the most comfortable right. airline. But yeah, the return of travel I think is definitely a big story that's driving the recovery. And it'll be interesting to see how Boeing, not to say that there was a defect on the plane right. that you were wrong, but overall deals <laughs> with those defects, right? Because that was the big story a couple weeks ago when you go back to earnings for Boeing was the profit and how these defects have sort of weighed on what Boeing's able to do. Again, seeing a demand boost here in that top line continuing to grow, they reaffirmed guidance, but the problem has been profits of what's going to come from Boeing in terms of avoiding some of these defects and being able to take advantage of demand will certainly be interesting to watch throughout the rest of the year. My play today, though, is Under Armour. Shares following are falling after the company's full year guidance for 2024 revenue and earnings per share came in lower than Wall Street analysts had hoped. Under Armour calling its full year 2024 a year of building the brand where it expects revenue to remain flat to slightly up. Now, more on that brand building. New CEO Stephanie Leinartz noting on today's call, quote, we are not pulling in our fair share of market growth. I believe a casual factor here is the inconsistency of how Under Armour brand shows up across our regions with the most significant opportunity to improve in the United States. And Sean, I know we've talked about this before, right? How popular it seems like Under Armour used to be when you go back maybe a decade ago. And I'm curious to see, they mentioned multiple athletes on the call. Steph Curry, who's had a very good playoffs right now, that's Under Armour's sort of star athlete. When you talk about building that brand, what are they able to do around a Steph Curry? Justin Jefferson, very popular receiver in the NFL. How do you make Under Armour cool again and more appealing in the U.S.? Because it's not good when part of your earnings call is basically talking about how Under Armour isn't as cool as it, as it could be and re rebuilding that brand. Yeah, right? which is always a bit surprising to me, given the fact that they do have that partnership, that close ties with Steph Curry, that they haven't been able to capitalize on that more, just given his sheer popularity. Mm -hmm. You talk about him being one of the most popular athletes that is still currently, certainly in the NBA, but really across all professional sports. Why Under Armour hasn't been able to really uh, profit more off of that has been a bit surprising, but they're exactly right. They have been certainly at a disadvantage. They have not been able to compete or really keep up with so many of its competitors, namely Nike inventory, a massive issue here for this company. They have been forced to offer more discounts in order to just get some of their inventory off of the shelves. They need a clear catalyst. And right now, we have to point out, the new CEO has only been in her job right. for a couple of months right now. But the turnaround picture, I think, is really what the street is waiting for. Yeah, that's a major question. If you take a look at Nike, it feels like they have so much momentum right now. We have the new Ben Affleck, Matt Damon <laughs> movie coming out. People are just talking about that brand more than Under Armour. And, you know, talking about Steph Curry and these brands partnering with those personalities, we've seen that really work for a lot of these footwear companies, Crocs, Post Malone. He made Crocs cool again. <laughs> right. So it's trying to find that new face, perhaps, that could be an Under Armour. You would think Steph Curry would be it. Well, I think yeah. the other thing, too, with Under Armour over the next couple months is just when you talk about a weakening consumer picture, right, and Under Armour sort of already struggling to get sales, 
Nike's probably going to be in a good position, right? People are going to keep buying Nikes. It's how do companies like Under Armour sort of overcome what might be weakening consumer demand, I think is an interesting story that's going to play out in retail in the next couple of months. Yeah, well, watching uh, shares of Under Armour. I'm also watching shares of Disney. That's my triple play today. A critical earnings report coming tomorrow for Bob Iger after the bell, especially as this company is currently facing a slew of challenges. Streaming losses are expected to continue to narrow in the quarter. That's one positive with consensus estimates calling for losses to narrow to $850 million after a loss of $1.1 billion in Q1 and a staggering $1.5 billion in Q4. Bob Iger has really stressed profitability, emphasizing the company is still on track to achieve streaming profitability by the year 2024. Then if we take a look at the park side of the business, that's expected to remain resilient operating income, expected to hit $2.14 billion after soaring to over for $3 billion in Q1. So slight deceleration, but analysts really bullish on the park side. That being said, though, guys, as we head into this earnings report, there's a lot of challenges here when it comes to this ongoing legal battle with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, when it comes to the Hollywood writer strike. And then in the background, you have this macro uncertainty with a slowing ad market, as well as inflation still high. And that CPI print coming tomorrow will give us a clear picture of how much prices have increased, but still. Yeah, exactly. And the impact that that could potentially have on the consumer. You're right. There's so many unknowns when it comes to Disney. And I think a lot of this focus is going to be on the earnings call. You and I were on the last Mm -hmm. earnings call, and it was certainly... Bob Iger had a lot of energy. A lot of people were very encouraged by what he had to say. We'll be interesting to see whether or not that tone is the same tomorrow. When we talk about Disney versus DeSantis, that has not really impacted shares yet. Whether or not that does down the line, that remains to be seen. And then you're right, higher prices. The sheer cost of going to the parks, any of these parks, (laughs) is crazy. The fact that people are still going and at the rate they're going, given the environment that we're in, that has really blown me away. Well, you, you saw people were going to Six Flags, though, too. They had attendance down slightly, but they were making money. And that was a positive stock going back to yesterday. So, and people seem bullish on Disney in the parks headed into this report. The other thing I'm watching tomorrow too is that signal out of ESPN and the earnings call, hopefully, yeah. and in the release, we'll get a closer look at their numbers than we've really ever gotten before. And I'm interested to see what comes of that. We certainly will see. That will be out tomorrow after the bell. Well, coming up, we are counting down to the closing bell on Wall Street. Stick with us on Yahoo Finance Live. That wraps up today's trading day. All three of the major averages under a bit of pressure as investors await tomorrow's report on inflation. You're looking at the Dow off just 54 points. S&P off about half of a percent. The Nasdaq leading to the downside, extending its declines here in the final couple minutes of trading, closing off just about six tenths of a percent. When you take a look at the sector action this afternoon, clearly technology, one of the underperformers in today's market action. Materials also right there with the communication service 
services, the XLC closing off just about a half of a percent. Let's get to check on some of the biggest movers of the day. Our Josh Schaefer joining us here on set to break it all down and kicking it off with PayPal. Look at those losses today, finishing in the red, off nearly 13% as the company turns to AI in an effort to appeal to investors. PayPal CEO Dan Schulman saying on the company's earnings call that they expect AI is going to enable them to meaningfully lower cost for years to come. Actually, the numbers for the most recent quarter weren't that bad. They came in better than the street was expecting in terms of some of the payment volume that we did see. But this is another tech company relying on AI, saying that how they're going to use that to their business to really boost their business down the line. And it sort of came up in the call because part of the call was about margins, right? And they were talking about essentially PayPal's margins. The guidance was not quite what the street was looking for, coming in a little bit lower. And that's because part of what's driving PayPal's growth right now is their lower margin, non-consumer facing business. Uh, and so when you take a look at sort of how to build that back and cut costs, one thing they turned to and mentioned was AI, which is interesting because they didn't specifically say it, but since IBM pointed out last week that AI might be able to replace some jobs and cut costs that way, I think you have some people sort of speculating here, well, if PayPal is going to use AI to significantly cut costs and make things more efficient, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean a decrease in headcount? Of course it could. And I think that's where things got interesting there when you think about PayPal. But as you said, Shauna, they didn't see really that volume decline. I know that's something we're going to be watching after the bell here when we think about a firm and the buy now, pay later space and if people are still buying, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And I think also a lot of people want to know who could potentially or who will potentially replace Shulman at the end of the year when he is expected to retire. We know PayPal has looked to cut costs here just a few months ago, announcing that they were going to be trimming 7% of the workforce, about 2,000 full-time workers, so maybe AI could potentially lead to more layoffs. All right, let's take a look at Boeing here, closing the day in the green, up just about 2%. Ryanair saying that it plans to buy at least 150 737 MAX 10 planes from Boeing. Also has the option to buy 150 more, so the potential total there for 300. The move puts a bridge over a long-running dispute over prices and delivery delays between Boeing and Ryanair. This is a boost that investors have been waiting for here from Boeing. Really signals here, Josh, in terms of the broader industry, the rebound that we've seen in travel. And so many of these airlines now looking to expand their fleet and replace some of those older plane models. They're using the planes more. They got more people on them, so they need new ones, right? And I think that's a great thing when you're Boeing and you're in that business of obviously building planes for these airlines that are getting more busy. Again, you see this really being important to Boeing's top line growth, right? When you're talking about revenue and getting more demand, that's something the company has been bullish on going back to their earnings call two weeks ago. They feel very confident in demand. The one thing that weighed on that stock though, back a couple weeks ago was the profit for the quarter and the overall profit outlook because Boeing has had some defect issues and it has in supply chain issues that have impacted their deliveries. So that is something to watch moving forward is can Boeing overcome that and continue to deliver planes and deliver them effectively as people keep ordering them. Yeah, exactly. Well, shares, at least for today, closing in the green, yeah. up just about 2%. Let's also take a look at Novavax. That closed higher. Look at that, up 27%, almost 30%, despite posting a wider-than-expected loss for the most recent quarter. Anjali Kamlani joining us now to break it all down. And Anjali, was a real focus just on what we could see here from Novavax in the future, and that seems to be what's moving the stock today. Absolutely. It's such a shift for the company with a new CEO in place. Place. You know that uh, they missed on the revenue, as as you just mentioned, uh, expecting and also significantly down from the quarter last year, uh, you know, where they were really in the thick of things in terms of orders. Uh, as you see, reporting about 80.95 uh, million. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, a little bit less than what was expected, which was closer to 95 million for revenue for the quarter. But all things told, we've got some nice signals from not just the, the new CEO, but also the new head of R&D about what to expect about this company, which, as we know, only has one product on the market, that's the COVID vaccine, and has several other vaccines in line, but only at the phase two mark. So they've got the uh, uh, RSV vaccine, they've got their flu vaccine, and the combo flu and COVID vaccine, all in various stages, uh, you know, phase two, phase three. 
Now, CEO telling us that one of the key things that has changed for this company now is that they now have an open line with the FDA. He said, quote, one thing we did was change the relationship with the FDA. If you recall, during the pandemic, really facing a tough time trying to get their vaccine through and to the finish line, and that's why they lagged behind the mRNA vaccines. Now, we're all, we also heard from the, C, uh, from the president of R&D, Philip Dubov Dubovsky, saying, quote, we didn't budget for the clinical work for any of these pipelines products. So to move them forward, it's going to have to be strategic partnerships. So you're hearing mixed messages, kind of like the mixed earnings today, uh, looking at, you know, down the line, what this company needs to get the rest of its pipeline advanced and to the finish line. And so, uh, you know, the company acknowledging that they cannot do it alone. They acknowledge, uh, you know, that they are, you know, winding down. They also had to cut uh, part of its workforce, 25%. They're also cutting R&D spend for the year. So all told, really mixed outlook, really interesting to see what this company has in store. Certainly is. All right, well, shares popping today, at least. Anjali Kamalani, thanks so much. Let's talk about the debt ceiling showdown. President Biden meeting with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and other top lawmakers this hour from both sides of the aisle. Joining us now to break it all down is Steve Clemens, Semaphore founding editor at large. Steve, it's great to see you again. So lots at stake here. Neither side seems to be backing down from their position. How much progress or do you think any progress is going to be made today? I honestly don't think much uh, progress is going to be made. I feel like we're in a Marvel movie and we need superheroes <laughs> to swoop down and save us from ourselves because we see the cataclysm that will happen. Trillions of dollars of economic wreckage if they don't come to terms with each other. Uh, and right now we're still in a period of posturing on both sides of the aisle. Um, I wish it would end and I wish I were, was wrong today because it would be great if Kevin McCarthy uh, in particular and Joe Biden, but we have to remember it's the big four. So it's McCarthy, uh, it's Hakeem Jeffries, it's Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell in that meeting. But the, but the big negotiation is between Biden uh, and McCarthy. And if they came out with a deal, it would be great for the markets, great for the economy. But I don't think we're going to get there today. Steve, how do you see this potentially playing out here? Because neither side seems to be offering what the other side views as a realistic solution and how dire this potential situation could get over the next couple of weeks. Well, I think the big thing that could happen is, is, is one that would be scary, and that is where the markets began to digest the fact that there might, in fact, be a default and, and that you have, like in any earthquake, four shocks of that. And so four shocks may be the disciplining function here. I just don't know. But the another side of it is that at the end of the day, uh, I think Kevin McCarthy has a complicated path here because, of course, he became Speaker of the House by cutting a deal with certain members of his caucus and making promises about what he would bring forward and attach to a debt ceiling rise. So his exit strategy from that uh, or his possibilities of an exit down, you know, off off ramp are very limited politically. Um, Joe Biden has not met with Kevin McCarthy after McCarthy has been knocking at the door, clawing, whimpering, saying, "Meet me, meet me," for about a hundred days, uh, somewhere about that. So, basically, Biden is keeping the Republicans waiting to wait and see what they came forward and saying, "I'm not going to pass anything but a debt ceiling." But people watching this say that one of two things could happen if you if, if you avoided outright default. One is they may agree implicitly that they pass a, a, a debt ceiling you know, increase, but that Joe Biden agrees to have separate talks on budget and potential budget cuts. That's one way out of this. Another way out of it is Joe Biden just decides to ignore all of this, cites Article 14 of the United States Constitution that says public debt will not be questioned, and just basically plays the constitutional play and makes a unilateral move. That would create a different kind of crisis, but you know, I got to tell you, there are a lot of articles in the Constitution that Republicans say are sacred, so they could basically make Article 14 sacred. Steve, what happens, though, if we do see what you just laid out as the first option, where they come to an agreement and President Biden does agree to additional talks here on potential cuts? What's the backlash that McCarthy could then maybe face amongst members of his own party? Well, I mean, it depends on how extreme some of them are. They, I don't know all of the nature of the deals, but there may be people like Representative Andy Biggs, you know, who can basically say, let's see how this plays out. But if they get, you know, they would like to see things like, uh, uh, you know, increase in, in, in worker requirements for uh, food stamp programs. They'd like to see a freeze in non-defense discretionary accounts down to 2022 
uh, levels. And so if they were to basically move somewhere along those lines, even in budget discussions, maybe Kevin McCarthy uh, can hold together his caucus. But remember, he needs 218 votes. He did it with 217 before because of some vacancies. But he's got to maintain a majority of his caucus or the Democrats need to come save him. And that's another interesting scenario we haven't talked about. I have talked to former leadership in the Democratic controlled house who said if if push comes to shove to save the nation some democrats may come uh and save mccarthy and keep him from doing you know causing a default but that mccarthy will have to pay a price for that to the democrats steve when it comes to president biden there was a new poll out from the washington post and abc over the weekend president biden's approval rating hitting a new low and also trailing Trump and DeSantis, if in fact DeSantis does decide to throw his hat in the ring for 2024. What do you think, or what would your advice be to President Biden just in terms of getting his message across to voters and getting more support even from members within his own party? Well, look, I've been you know, critical of, of President Biden's approach on this debt ceiling side. There's also a Gallup poll that shows only 35% of Americans have any faith or hope that the people making these economic decisions, in particular the president, are competent at what they're doing. Uh, we wrote about that in Semaphore today. But I think the big thing that's been missing is a broader discussion with the American public about what the consequences of a, a debt uh, default might be, what are the components of it, and also to ask some of the questions Joe Manchin's been asked about. Why has the debt gone basically from a very low level in 2000. And so now we're 20 years later and we're up at $31 trillion. What drove that? And, and also just to kind of look at how it got there, whether it was COVID, whether it was wars, whether it was bad tax programs, that we have essentially a gluttonous dimension to American politics that needs to be discussed. And I think if Joe Biden did that honestly and had that conversation with the nation, his numbers would be higher. But right now, even though Donald Trump contributed enormously to the U.S. debt, significantly, almost more than any other president. Then you have him looking like the fiscal conservative uh, at this moment, which is uh, unusual, to say the least. It certainly is unusual. Steve Clemens, always great to have you. Thanks so much for making the time to join us here today. Semaphore founding editor at large. All right, coming up, home prices falling in the first quarter. Find out where prices drop the most. We've got those details for you when we come back.
Taking a look at shares of Airbnb off just about 10% following the company's most recent earnings release here. Taking a look at these numbers, a big reason why we're looking at shares under pressure here is because of its second quarter revenue guidance here for the current quarter. Coming in a bit light, the street was looking for $2.4 billion and Airbnb giving a range of 2.35 billion to 2.45 billion. So at the lower end of what the street was looking for, that of course weighing on shares. Also nights and experiences booked coming in at 121.1 million. The estimate was for 122.3 million. We take a look though at the overall revenue for its most recent quarter, that coming in better than what the street was looking for, 1.82 billion. Also gross booking value slightly ahead of what the street was looking for at 20.4 billion. But again, the light guidance, that is one of the things that's weighing on shares here in extended trading off just about 10%. All right, let's take a look at the real estate market. Home prices are on the decline across the U.S., with nearly a third of metro areas posting annual price decreases for houses on the market in the first quarter. That's according to the latest numbers that we're getting from the National Association of Realtors. We want to bring in Danielle Hal, Realtor.com chief economist, joining us now. Danielle, it's good to see you here. So just what's your assessment of this report and what it tells us about the state of housing at play today? Well, this report covers local market data. So we're looking at city level data and it shows us, it reminds us really that real estate is local. And so even though we're seeing nationwide trends with home prices declining slightly uh, nationwide, what, what we're seeing is that in some markets, the declines are quite acute. And in other markets, we're actually seeing home prices continue to go up. So real estate is local. And this report today really just hammers that home. You take into effect some of the price declines, though, that we are seeing. How much of that has to do with the fact that inventory levels are so low? Yeah, so inventories are up compared to a year ago, but still down in most markets about half of what they were before the pandemic. That's not true everywhere. In fact, mm -hmm. our data show that uh, the Austin, Texas market in particular is back up to where it was before the pandemic. And we're also seeing bigger inventory growth in a lot of the markets out the out in the West. And these are the same markets that are seeing home prices soften or decline. And so it really is, is affecting the balance of supply and demand. But it's not just a supply story. It's also a bit of a demand story. And we're just not seeing as much of it in the West because that's where prices have been the highest and where households have really struggled the most to keep up with those high prices. Yeah, so many home buyers, especially first time home buyers have been priced out of the market. Danielle, I think a lot of people out there, if they're sitting on the sidelines, they're not ready, they're not really sure if they should sell their house now or if you're a potential home buyer, you don't know if now's the right time to look. Is the worst of housing, is that behind us? Or what do you think the next several months could potentially look like? You know, I think when it comes to sales activities and the number of home transactions taking place, I think we have seen the low, but I think it's going to be a slow climb from here. If you look at a lot of existing homeowners, they have mortgage rates that are well below current market mortgage rates. And so they have to have a lot of uh, a pretty strong incentive to make a move today because financially it's going to be more expensive if they sell their home. Now, fortunately, a lot of those homeowners have seen some equity creation from the fact that prices have gone up so much over the past couple of years, notwithstanding the recent you know, softness in prices in the West. So they've got a good equity cushion, but with mortgage rates where they are, it's going to be expensive to make a move. So it's hard for them to make the transition. They've got to have life factors or job factors really requiring them to make a move. And on the flip side, for first time home buyers, you know, with prices up so much, they've got to really amass a critical amount of savings to get into the market. And so it continues to be a challenging market for both buyers and sellers who want to turn around and buy again. As a result, I think we're going to see sales climb very slowly from this level unless we see a big adjustment in mortgage rates. And I'm just not seeing that anytime soon. It's going to be a pretty slow, gradual recovery from here. Yeah, Danielle, what do you think is ahead when it comes to mortgage rates? Because here we are trending to the upside here. When we started the year, there was lots of talk about that. Maybe we'd fall back to 6%, even below that 6% level. Do you still see that as a potential here before the end of the year? You know, our forecast for the year had mortgage rates actually higher than they are now. <laughs> um, but I think the story is right. So we thought that inflation would be a little bit more persistent than it has, uh, than people were initially expecting. And so that's going to put upward pressure on mortgage rates. I do think we're starting to see progress on mortgage rates, and especially with the Fed signaling that they're close potentially to the end of the tightening cycle. Uh, I think that's going to help and we'll see long term rates start to gradually ease in the second half of the year and mortgage rates are likely to follow them down. 
We're certainly not going back to 3% anytime soon, but I do think we'll get back into the low sixes by the end of the year. Danielle, what about the rental market? So many people are priced out of the home buyer market. Obviously, that has really boosted demand for rentals out there. Are those dynamics at all changing? You know, it's interesting. We're seeing a lot of the d geographic dispersion that we're seeing in the housing market and for sale prices is very similar to what we're seeing in the rental market. So those expensive coastal markets, particularly in the West Coast, we're seeing some softening. In fact, even some year over year declines in certain markets, um, whereas in the Midwest, there's a lot more affordability. We're seeing rents continue to go up. So it really matters where you are and how affordable your housing market is. And we're seeing those affordable markets are doing better from both a home price and a rent perspective, whereas those expensive markets are, are seeing a bit of an adjustment. All right, Danielle Howell, thanks so much for joining us here. Realtor.com Chief Economist. Coming up next, a preview of April's CPI reading the latest on inflation. We'll bring you those details when we come back. All eyes will be focused on the April CPI report set to be released tomorrow morning. Yahoo Finance senior reporter Ali Canal, Alexandra Canal, joining us now. Ali, lots of focus whether or not we're going to see significant or really any improvement. Mm -hmm. What do you think we'll see? Well, the good news is that as far as the estimates go, inflation is expected to remain consistent to the levels that we saw in March. But the bad news is, is that inflation is still going to be significantly higher than the Federal Reserve's 2% target. So here are the numbers to watch. Year-over-year -year headline inflation is expected to have risen 5% in April. So like I said, consistent with those March numbers. On a month 
month over month basis though, estimates are calling for a bit of an acceleration due to higher gas prices. So 0.4% in April versus March's 0.1%. Then if you take a look at core inflation, which strips out the more volatile costs of food and gas, prices are once again pretty on par with March, a 5.5% annual gain and a 0.4% monthly gain are the expectations there. So still elevated pricing levels that the Fed would obviously like to see moderate, but I will say that looking ahead to tomorrow's print, anything that comes in significantly hotter than expected, that is going to spook the markets because it just raises those risks that the Fed will once again raise interest rates in June. Yeah, Ali, what, what's the thought out there on the street just in terms of what this print, how the Fed will be looking at that print, how that's going to potentially play into their decision in June? Well, right now, if we take a look at data from CME Group, mar markets are pricing in an 80 percent chance that the Federal Reserve leaves those rates unchanged. That's been largely driven by the commentary we saw last week with Fed Chair Jerome Powell saying the central bank could pause its hikes as it assesses that incoming data. On top of that, we did receive revisions to mar uh, those job numbers from both March and February, which signaled a resilient but cooling labor market, which gave investors further hope the Fed could pause rates. That being said, though, we have heard from analysts at Wells Fargo who said, quote, the path back to 2 percent will be long and bumpy. We also received a note from UBS late last week that showed that although that there was the will be risks to the Fed potentially hiking those rates in June, overall, the bank maintained that we likely won't see that. However, uh, depending on the data that we do get tomorrow, along with various divergent opinions from FOMC participants, things could get noisy and noisy could mean volatile. That's a quote from UBS. So a lot riding on tomorrow's print. It's something that we'll be watching closely. We certainly will be tomorrow morning before the markets open. Ali, thanks so much. The pandemic changed the way that people work, especially when it comes to meetings. And now Microsoft is actually quantifying it for us. The tech giant releasing its annual workplace productivity report, and it shows just how much time we are all spending in Zoom rooms. The report finding that people spend the equivalent of two days a week in meetings or on email. It's a heck of a lot of time. Diane King Hall is back with us here to discuss this. And Diane, I think a lot yeah. of the question is whether or not your productivity yeah. goes up if you work from home because you're not distracted in the right. office. But it sounds like you're spending a heck of a lot of time looking into that computer and yeah. your Zoom meetings. Indeed. Let me give it a little bit more context. Now, those figures don't even include time spent on instant messaging like Slack or other impromptu conversations. A study showing that both workers and bosses are complaining this digital overload is affecting their abilities to do their actual jobs, especially the more innovative or creative aspects. In fact, about two thirds of workers say all the pings and dings detracts from their time and energy. So you're going to get that at home, too, when we're talking about, you know, just the possible detractors from time. And one of the things that was of note in this report from Microsoft is that the meetings, people complain about them, but there's also this FOMO aspect to those meetings like are you both missing out could it potentially affect your role within your workplace if you're not in the room uh, but I will say it does seem to be a little bit of an agenda because this is all in the AI context for this report so you know Microsoft a leader in the AI space Base, so, you know, I feel a little biased here, yes. I don't know, but it is. But we have seen it. this was a fear that so many people were spending mm -hmm. so much time in meetings. And we've right. seen some companies make some changes to try to address this. Shopify was one of those companies yep. that announced that they were going to be scheduling blocks of times that employees should not be allocated or should not be in meetings. Some companies went as far as blocking off a specific day. Yeah. Our company, actually, Yahoo, even did that for a period of time. And in a recent interview, Shopify's uh, chief operating officer saying that they deleted 322,000 hours of meetings by making some of those adjustments. Yes. That is a lot of time. And you take into account that so many people aren't able to do their own work because they're spending it in meetings. I think the real question, though, is how productive each of these meetings right. are. Right, meetings and emails, because, you know, I'm recently, I'm new to the company, but already the flood of emails, and it's like, what's important, what's not important? Yeah. So one of the other things that stood out within uh, this survey, this report, uh, was about how comfortable people would be with AI playing more of a role with regard to this. And so, you know, people did say they'd be comfortable with using AI for administrative tasks. I get that, because 
because some of those admin tasks, you're like, can a robot do this, please? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wouldn't mind if it took some off my plate some days. All right, Diane, thanks so much. All right, you got it. Coming on for that. Let's take a look at shares of Occidental Petroleum. They are trading lower after the company reported weaker than expected first quarter results. Just at earnings coming in at a dollar and nine cents a share. That was lower than what the street was looking for, a dollar twenty-three a share revenue. Also coming in just below the street's expectations at $7.23 billion. The estimate was for $7.33 billion. Now, this coming after Warren Buffett said over the weekend that he would not be seeking full control of the oil company. That was something that investors had speculated about going into the shareholder meeting over the weekend. We know Buffett does currently have a 23.6% stake in Occidental Petroleum. When he was making those comments, Buffett also went on to say that, quote, we've got the right management in place. All right, well, Wendy's is bringing AI to its drive through More on that coming up. Wendy's is partnering with Google Cloud to bring AI to its drive throughs Now, this is called Wendy's Fresh AI. The pilot kicks off in June in Columbus, Ohio area at a company-operated restaurant. Brooke De Palma is here with those details. Brooke, it sounds exciting. Good afternoon. It certainly does sound exciting. Pretty interesting here. I'm eager to see how exactly it works. But as you noted, this is one of uh, the first partnerships that have come out of this collaboration between Google, uh, Google Cloud and Wendy's. That partnership began in 2021. This is called Wendy's Fresh AI. The first pilot of Wendy's Fresh AI is set to launch in June in Columbus, Ohio, near its headquarters in Dublin, Ohio. Now, in addition to that, the company wants you to know that the AI technology has the ability to understand made-to-order requests, which they say includes billions of different combinations. For example, if a customer asks for a large milkshake, this technology will know that they're asking for a frosty. In addition to that, they said that it'll be as natural as interacting with employees eager to see if customers
customers think so as well. And in this pilot, customers can expect a female voice. Now, what you also need to know is that Wendy's expects here to improve speed, accuracy, and consistency with this automated technology. And based on this pilot, Wendy's is looking for a few key things. In addition to that drive-through speed, the customer is also taking a closer look at order averages. They hope to see a boost in sales with upselling opportunities that the AI technology will offer, like larger sizes, asking customers perhaps if they want a frosty with their orders, in addition to daily specials. And this comes as drive-through remains a key opportunity for Wendy's. About 75 to 80 percent of Wendy's customers prefer drive-through. Now, Sean, that's a big jump compared to roughly two-thirds before the COVID-19 pandemic. And Wendy's hoping to be not only a game-changer here, but a leader in AI technology in the drive-through. It certainly makes sense. It certainly seems like that with the recent moves there. When it comes to AI, we talk about how so many companies are talking about it on their earnings releases. It sounds like Wendy's isn't the only food company, not the only fast food chain that's incorporating AI. Who are some of the others? Right, certainly not alone in that. In fact, this is probably the top, if not the topic of this earnings season. I mean, we heard McDonald's mention it in their earnings call, but in addition to that, they also teamed up with IBM back in 2021 to further accelerate and to development um, and deployment of their automated voice ordering technology. We've heard some customer feedback about the accuracy of it. A bit of a, a rough start there. Wingstop in March partnered with AI voice startup Converse now. They're running a pilot where they're order, uh, they're using voice AI powered virtual virtual assistants to take customers phone orders at select locations. We're also seeing Yum brands using recommended ordering to understand how much food is needed at restaurants and Chipotle using AI for kitchen management to streamline operations. They also introduced Chippy the robot and what they call an AI kitchen assistant to make chips. Chipotle CFO also weighed on the opportunity saying that it is taking a well thought out approach. Take a listen. There's a lot of possibilities. There's also a lot of pitfalls as well. So we want to be very careful, very thoughtful. But certainly if there's ways we can make the, uh, you know, the job that our crews do, the jobs that our support staff do to support a restaurant, you know, easier, better. And, you know, if the end result is we can run better restaurants and serve the customers uh, in a better way, we're certainly going to look at any technology. And of course, this earnings season's not over yet. There's more food companies set to report later on this week, including Wendy's before the bell on Wednesday. We also have Cheesecake Factory after the bell on Wednesday, in addition to Krispy Kreme Thursday before the bell. And so certainly something to look out for, something that we've heard not only from food chains, but also PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, looking to get into the AI mix here. And so something for investors and also Main Street to look out for. Perhaps you'll be ordering your drive through a little bit different in the near future. All right, Brooke, exciting stuff. Thanks so much. And also a quick programming note here. Be sure to tune in on Thursday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi. He will be speaking with Wendy's CEO and president. That all kicks off on Thursday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time. You won't want to miss that. Let's take a look at shares of Rivian. They're trading to the upside, up nearly 5% after reporting earnings. The company reporting a better than expected revenue, $661 million. Also, a narrower than expected loss. The company also says that it's on track to deliver 50,000 vehicles this year. We want to bring in Jordan Levy. He's Truist Securities Equity Research Analyst. Jordan, it's good to see you here. So the street seems to like this report. What's your first take? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think it, what it comes down to is, look, we already knew what the production and the delivery numbers were for the quarter. How is spend trending for the company? Because when it comes down to it, investors want to see the company is spending less, having a lower cash burn rate and hitting their production targets. And I think Rivian gave us that. Anything, though, just in terms of what the potential or what the next few months could potentially look like for Rivian, given the fact that some consumers are beginning to pull back on spending. How big of a risk is that for Rivian? Yeah, so I think that's going to be the big focus into the earnings call coming up is you know, they they no longer provide the order book numbers specifically, but what is demand doing? What are they seeing in terms of trend for their order book? And you know, they have a pretty extensive runway at last quarter's earnings in terms of backlog to work through. Uh, we're going to look for signs that that's continuing to be strong and that demand is continuing to trend up. Now, uh, this is a it's a brand that's in the process of building. So I think that plays in their advantage. Jordan, you've reduced your price target a couple of times, cut it to 28 from 44 bucks a share. After this report, 
Are you more optimistic on Rivian? Or I guess, what, what is that catalyst that would make you a little bit more optimistic going forward? Yeah, sure. I think I think it's all a, all a game of execution at this point. We want to see them trending toward hitting their numbers. We want to see that ramp in production go as planned. Uh, and we, we want to see demand hold in strong. So, so you know, we're looking for all of those signs, but certainly you know, the macro conditions being what they are, every step that they can show that production is on trend, given some of the supply chain issues they've had, I think is a, a big positive for the name. Yeah, Jordan, speaking of those supply chain issues, they did reaffirm the production numbers like we were talking about. There are plans to build 50,000 vehicles. Where do those supply chain snags, have those been resolved in some of those operational challenges? Where does that all stand today? Yeah, so I think what, what Rivian has talked to previously is uh, the, the power semiconductor availability being some so, sort of the gating factor in their ability to ramp production. And it seems based on some conversations we've had that that's trending in the right direction. I don't think uh, by any means it's completely resolved, but certainly Rivian is doing some things internally in terms of uh, new technologies they're rolling out that improves that and, uh, and their ability to uh, achieve those targets. And it seems like those are working for now. We also know that they've made some moves to cut some of their costs here and a move that a number of players within their space and really across the board are making in this challenging time. When you take a look at the moves that they have done, are further cost cutting measures necessary, do you think? I think the plan they've laid out so far is sort of the plan they need to get to that 2024 positive gross margin target they've laid out. And I think really at this point, it just comes down to executing and getting those steps in order and making sure that they're trending in the right direction there. Their electric last a mile delivery van that they have in partnership with Amazon. How big of a boost do you really see this being to their business? And I guess, what have you made of that partnership just in terms of Rivian getting their name out, their brand out, making it more recognizable on Main Street? Yeah, I think it's huge. And it's really one of the underlying uh, parts of our bull thesis on Rivian. And really, if you if you look at some of their competitors, uh, uh, some of their competitors' commercial segments, that's where there's been a lot of strength recently. And, and not only does it help them sort of build out brand recognition by seeing you know, Rivian's delivery vans on the road in partnership with Amazon, but also the technology and the data that it affords them by having to, the ability to accumulate so many miles from the uh, delivery drivers that are on the road and leverage that data uh, for their broader software and landscape. All right, Rivian shares on the move following these better than expected results here from the EV maker. Jordan Levy, great to have you. Truist Securities Equity Research Analyst. Well, coming up, media companies are struggling to stay alive in the current landscape. What's ahead for the industry next?
President Biden meeting with top congressional leaders on the debt ceiling has begun. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell are in the Oval Office in an attempt to make some progress towards a deal to avert a default. Well, BuzzFeed reporting a first quarter net loss, $36.6 million. A company, company recently announcing that it's slashing its workforce and shutting down its news division. Now, this follows results from Fox, which reported a $50 million loss in the third quarter tied to expenses relating to its settlement with Dominion. With so much happening in the media world, we want to bring in Washington Post media reporter Alahe Azadi. Alahe, it's great to see you again here. So, of course, let's start with Fox because it's the first public comments that we've gotten from a Lachlan Murdoch since the settlement with Dominion, also since the firing of Tucker Carlson. What did you make of the results that we got today and what we heard from Murdoch? Yeah, a few things. One, Tucker Carlson was not mentioned by name, but it's you know notable that since he's been fired, the ratings for Fox News at his hour have dropped dramatically. And uh, today, Lachlan Murdoch made no indication that they're going to divert or change their editorial strategy. It seemed to be, if you read between the lines, that Carlson's firing represented a tweaking of a strategy, but that there would be no departure from what Fox has done um, for many years and for some time. The other thing that was notable was an acknowledgement that uh, the settlement had a cost to the company and that in this case, um, you know, Lachlan Murdoch made mention that they, Fox was limited in what they could argue at trial and that uh, he said something to the effect of, you know, we settled this to not drag this out. Um, but the very notable thing to me is what was said about another lawsuit that Fox News is facing against another voting technology company called Smartmatic. That is a $2.7 billion defamation lawsuit that we do not expect to go to trial if it does make it to trial until 2025. And Lachlan Murdoch said something to the effect of, well, this, this case is fundamentally different. Um, I'm not sure how different it is. We are going to see how that proceeds, but it is um, a different company. It's going to be a different state. It's going to, you know, it's going to unfold perhaps differently, but there's still a ways out. Um, and then the other thing that's notable is that Fox also um, is facing several shareholder lawsuits for how the company handled the lawsuit from Dominion Voting Systems, which ended with a settlement of $778.5 million, about half of what was there. Um, but the company did incur a loss, um, the $50 million loss, uh, net loss in this quarter. If you compare it to the same period last year, same period last year, they posted over $200 million gain for that period. Yeah, Alay, did you get a sense that Fox is just trying to leave all of these issues in the past? Because it didn't seem like they wanted to address the severity of the events that have taken place over the last several months, pertaining specifically to the Dominion lawsuit, also to what we heard uh, from Tucker Carlson, the decision to fire him. And then Smartmatic, it seemed like they almost just wanted to dismiss the risk that that would potentially pose here to shareholders, given the sheer size of it. Yeah, I think the argument here and from when this news of the settlement came out and Fox put out a statement was that they want to put this behind them. They don't want this to drag on and that it serves it for in everyone's best interest to just end this matter and move on. Um, they're still fighting in court over redactions being um unveiled because there's still some things that we, even though so much was made public during the Dominion legal fight um, through discovery, that there were still some of these private internal communications that were redacted. And Fox has argued that a settlement took place precisely so that this matter could be ended and move on. Um, and yeah, I'm projecting a sense of the company is in good shape. Um, revenue did go up by 18%. It did post a loss, obviously, um, due to these legal fights, but that the argument here is that it was in the best interest of the company financially going forward to settle and not to worry about the Smartmatic case. Well, what do you, what's your sense of the sluggish ad market? Because there have been some hope that we would start to see a recovery. I think when you take a look at some of the tech giants that reported uh, several weeks ago, they had some, uh, shown some signs that things were improving. Yet when you take a look at some of these media companies, it doesn't seem like that's exactly translated here to some of the traditional media players. Is that in line with what you're seeing? I guess what does that tell us just about the next several months? 
And every memo about company-wide layoffs from, you know, digital startups to legacy media companies, there is made mention of a soft ad market and that this is something that media companies are still grappling with. I don't know if it's so much as the reality on the ground or concerns into forecasting of what's around the corner and, and having to mitigate for that. And also it's important to note that for a lot of companies, it's it's the ad market, but it's also audience numbers and that if the mar if you have a lot of audience but the ad market is soft you know it doesn't matter how many people are viewing your content if the ad market is soft and so there's a calculation going into there but yes i still think this is a concern at many media companies that the ad market is still soft um, and that ad revenue has gone down um during the pandemic in the beginning we did see a lot more um, audience numbers, that audience numbers went up for a lot of uh, journalism and a lot of news content. The ad, the ad market was soft. And I still think that there is this concern right now with uncertainty in the economy. And the, I read in every single layoff memo that, that comes across my desk. And when you take a look at some of the trends that are going on within the media space, a lot of these disruptors, it seems like, is having a hard time competing with the more traditional players within media. Take a look at what's happening to Vice, the fact that BuzzFeed shut down its news division. What do you think this signals just about the future media landscape and what that's going to look like? Yeah, it's interesting if we look at specifically Vice and BuzzFeed, I would say they're in one of the earlier iterations of disruptors because a lot of the practices that especially BuzzFeed engaged in, um, outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post started adopting those practices or poaching their reporters um, and you know doing listicles and that sort of thing. And that was you know in the 2010s. And I think in those cases, what you saw was a lot of venture capital invested into and a lot of funding into these companies and they couldn't expand fast enough to, to meet that investment. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we're, as we were seeing, you know, Vice probably were heading into bankruptcy, BuzzFeed News shutting down and BuzzFeed trying to figure out how to get on firmer financial footing. Um, we still see new digital media outlets getting into the space, raising capital. The Messenger is about to start with 150 employees. Um, they already acquired another venture startup, uh, Grid News, and shut that down. And so I always say whenever you have a space like media where there is a lot of volatility and people trying to figure out how to make this business model work or what can work, you're always going to have experimentation. And within that experimentation, there will be failures. And as we were talking here in just the last couple of minutes, Tucker Carlson actually just tweeted out, we're back, and that he's taking his show to Twitter, reaching a deal with Elon Musk. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think they had some conversations reportedly um, and Twitter and Elon Musk, that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation, right? And how disruptive that can be. Um, but you know, in that, there is always this sort of existential question with Fox, whether these really popular personalities on Fox are popular because they're on Fox or they bring viewers to Fox. Now, we see in the past week or two since Tucker Carlson has been fired and is no longer in that time slot, the ratings have dropped dramatically. Fox could promote a new personality and, and put them and they could be successful in that time slot. And I think that's going to be something to watch. Will Tucker Carlson be able to get as much prominence, as much influence and as many viewers on Twitter as he did on Fox? Who makes who powerful? That is a very, very good point, because we know in the past that that hasn't exactly happened, that Fox News viewers stay very loyal to Fox News rather than following the big uh, personalities there. Alahi Azadi, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Well, it's closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Let's get you caught up to speed with some of the biggest headlines of the day. We're going to bring that to you when we come back.
It's closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Let's get you caught up on some of the biggest headlines of the day. First up, betting company Temper Sealy is acquiring mattress retailer Mattress Firm. The $4 billion deal will be comprised of $2.7 billion in cash and $1.3 billion in stock. The deal is expected to close in the second half of 2024. Looking ahead to tomorrow, investors will be closely watching the April CPI report. Economists expect the headline inflation data to show a tick up in inflation on month over month basis and flat year over year. And Disney releasing its fiscal second quarter results tomorrow after the market closes. We will be paying attention to find out what CEO Bob Iger has to say about streaming, the consumer and the ongoing feud with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. That'll do it for us today on Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time for all your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a good night.